I, I, uh, this is a different talk from the one I normally give, and it's inspired by something that I'm sure you all follow pretty closely. I'm a, I'm a Tor author, which means that I'm a Macmillan or Holtzbrink author in the States anyway, and I was pretty uh, surprised to wake up one morning and find a bunch of email from journalists asking if I knew why my publisher had pulled all my books from Amazon. This is before we knew exactly what had happened to all the Macmillan titles on Amazon. And um, all my books are published simultaneously on creative, uh, as Creative Commons downloads with their print editions. So done here by HarperCollins, done in the States by, by Tor. And it, it means that a, a, a disproportionate number of my books are sold online because people find them online and they, they go on to buy them through Amazon and whatnot. So it was very, uh, it's very personal when this, when this happens. And also I've got a long and pretty good history with Amazon. Um, my first novel was the first book Jeff Bezos ever reviewed on Amazon. So it's, it's, it's always been, you know, I've always had a very cozy relationship. So I was pretty shocked by, by what happened and pretty, pretty uh, fascinated by what unraveled over the next week or so as we found out what had gone on and watched the, the brinksmanship uh, go forward. And it, it made me really start to think about uh, publishing ebooks and pricing. And so that's what I'm going to try and talk about a little today. So the, uh, the question that everyone wants to ask is what's the best price? What's the best price for a printed book? What's the best price for an ebook? And it's obviously it's not the highest price. I think we all understand that if Amazon had said, well, in order to make Macmillan happy, we're going to charge $100 for every ebook, that this would have been just as bad for Macmillan's ebook sales as a $10 ebook. That, that the, the highest price is not the greatest. The lowest price may not be the greatest. It may not maximize Macmillan's profits or Bloomsbury's profits if those books are priced at 10p each or one cent each or if they gave you a pound to take them off the shelves. So the lowest price isn't the best, the highest price isn't the best, and the price is not related to what the publisher's inputs cost, at least as far as the, the reader is concerned. So uh, a way of understanding this, I've read Slush for Tor a couple of times. I've, I've been around, hanging around Tor since I was a grub. I was like 17 and you know, finding my way to New York and hanging out at their offices. And, and they know what to do with, you know, clever 17-year-olds. You throw mountains of slush at them and say, just take anything that appears to be written in English and put it in this pile and throw away the rest. So I read Slush at Tor, and there are some notable, um, uh, wonderful, terrible cover letters in the slush. But the one that is a kind of recurring theme is, Dear Publisher, please find this book. I took a year off my job. Or please find this proposal. I will have to take a year off my job, which pays $100,000 a year, in order to finish the book. Therefore, I will take $100,000 from you for this book. <laughs> and I think we all understand intuitively why publishers don't care how much it costs the writer to write the book. Right? That's exactly the same reason that readers don't care what it costs the publisher to print the book or publish the book. Um, or organize the book or buy the book or market the book or whatever. I, I, I don't... I don't for a second, say that you as publishers shouldn't be watching those two numbers pretty closely. And if, and if one is substantially bigger than the other, uh, it will be very profitable. And if the other one is substantially bigger than the first, it will be very unprofitable. But as a reader, it is not compelling to me to walk into a bookstore and say the reason that this book costs five quid and that this book costs ten quid is that this book costs the publisher twice as much to procure and print because the writer wanted more or because the... the uh, uh, agent was a better negotiator or because this one's been printed on you know, hammered gold. It's, as, as a reader, it doesn't really matter to me. So the best price isn't the high price, it isn't the low price, it's the price that yields the highest profits over a sustainable term, obviously. So how do you get to that price? Well, I think that there's two great unarticulated theories of pricing. Um, one is uh, demand elasticity, which is the idea that low prices bring in more people. And even though there may be someone out there who's willing to pay a higher price, you can make it up in volume. And the other one is uh, price discrimination, which is essentially that someone out there wants to pay five pounds for this cup of coffee, and someone wants to pay one pound for the cup of coffee, and you need to figure out a way to segment those two audiences and sell Mr. Five Pound his five pound latte, and sell Mr. Uh, Chav Coffee his one pound coffee. Uh, and, and, and that makes everybody happy. The law and at econ people, the Milton Friedmanites, all over price discrimination. It's, it's everybody, everybody in the boardroom tends to love price discrimination. Um, so price discrimination, figuring out how to get the most of your customers, you can see lots of good examples of it in travel, for example. There, you know, if, if, if you were to actually, if you could get on an airplane and say, hands up everyone who paid more than 500 pounds for a ticket, hands up everyone who paid more than 300, you'll find out that people paid vastly different sums for their tickets, and airlines are kind of masters of price discrimination, and they have lots of heuristics or rules of thumb to figure out 
who's willing to pay what. So they go, well, if you're staying on a Saturday, you're probably, uh, 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 you're, or you're not willing to stay on a Saturday, rather, you're probably a business traveler. And if you're a business traveler, someone else is buying your ticket, so you don't care what it costs. So if you don't stay on a Saturday, your ticket costs more. Not because there's something magical about staying on Saturdays that makes you more expensive to haul from one part of the world to the other, but because this is a way of segmenting their markets. Um, and you know this goes all the way through travel. So there's a reason that your five pound coffee can be found very close to the business lounge at Heathrow, and your one pound coffee will be found near the uh, train station, right? Because people who are traveling, who are, who've already bought a business class ticket, a five pound coffee is not much of a hardship for them. And again, this is all price discrimination. The actual uh, material and labor inputs into an individual cup of coffee are kind of un insignificant, right? It has almost no relationship at all to the cost. It's all about what they think they can get. And of course, there's everyone's favorite, the mini bar fridge, which is, you know, kind of masterpiece of price discrimination. Um, figuring out that there's someone out there who will indeed pay nine pounds for a pack of nuts. So, uh, you see this in places like Walt Disney World, where they figured out how to price out hotel rooms at a thousand different price points, and you know they built out this resort that has sub resorts, and those sub resorts have sub resorts, and all the way down to there's you know a glorified car park you can pitch a tent in, and they really want to figure out how to capture every every penny that you're willing to spend when you get to Orlando. Uh, and then um, obviously Hollywood are great masters of this, so you have the cinematic release. And then you have uh, limited window releases onto airplanes and to hotel pay-per-view systems. And then you have uh, DVD releases. And then you have cable television. And then you have broadcast television windows. And they've, they've really figured out that to, to a nicety. And so there's nothing <coughs> wrong with price discrimination per se. But it has one serious drawback, which is arbitrage. The idea that someone might figure out, someone from a higher price band might figure out how to buy something from the lower price band. So someone might decide that it's worth waiting for the paperback to come out. Uh, even though they've got enough disposable income to buy a hardcover. Um, someone might decide to order a pizza to their hotel room. Um, someone might decide that staying in the posh resort in Disney World isn't worth it, and they'll put the kids in a tent in the Fort Wilderness Campground Resort. Um, all of those things are, are uh, the enemies of price discrimination. And you see this when, if you've ever bought a DVD abroad and brought it back, and you find that it won't play in your DVD player because you're one of the few who bought a region locked DVD player, that's all about stopping people from arbitraging around price discrimination. And this is the problem with price discrimination, is that it requires that you be, at the very least, somewhat obfuscatory, right? But by and large, you have to be opaque. You don't want your customers to know that if they don't stay on a Saturday, they'll get, they'll get a, a, a more expensive plane ticket. You want them to just, to just think that everyone's getting the same price. There was a bit of a scandal a few years ago when Amazon was doing something. There are lots of stories about why they were doing it. But depending on whether or not you were logged into Amazon, you got different prices for different books. So, and what people think, and what may or may not have been the case, is that Amazon was looking at your purchase history and going, you'll probably go an extra fiver for that book, and <coughs> turning the price up. Right, so there's a certain amount of obfuscation when you do this. And there's a certain amount of coercion when you do it. Right? So the, the airline doesn't really want you to know. The entertainment industry has figured out how to lock your DVD player. And all of this is, is um, if you take it to its logical extreme, turns the firm into something that is fundamentally at war with its customers, in the business of tricking its customers, in the business of fighting its customers, in the business of outmaneuvering its customers. And you know everyone has to do a little bit of this. This is why we have shoplifting detectors in the front door of, uh, of, of most shops. But when this becomes the nature of your business, you start to be more like you know the off license near a prison and less like you know a nice uh, mom and pop bookstore with with lovely shelves that people like to come in and hang out in and spend their discretionary income on. Um, so and that's why it rubs up against against uh, this idea of price demand elasticity. Uh, the, 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 this, this, this worry that there might be someone out there who's going to buy for, at the lower price rather than the higher price limits how many low price offerings you can make. And it sometimes drives firms into doing crazy things. So I was at a conference once, and there was a, it was a kind of internet-y thing. And there were some people from the music industry and the digital distribution side of the music industry on stage. And they were describing a now defunct digital distribution system for music. It was like iTunes.